Welcome to Electron Online, and here is a very interesting problem that you may have seen before somewhere. It is a question about traveling through the Earth. The assumption is that we could bore a hole all the way through the Earth. Of course, technically that would be impossible. Let's say we could. And we had a vehicle that could travel through the Earth simply by allowing gravity to take a hold of it and make it accelerate all the way till it reaches the center of the Earth. It will reach its maximum speed at the equilibrium point at the center of the Earth. And then as it continues on the other side, gravity would start slowing it down and you would reach zero velocity by the time you get to the other side. All assuming, of course, that there's no friction, no wind resistance, nothing to hold it back, nothing to slow it down, so that all the energy would be stored here as potential energy would be converted to complete kinetic energy and then back stored into potential energy when it reaches the other side of the Earth. The question is, if we could do that, what would be the time it would take for the object to travel through the Earth like that? This is, of course, only possible, theoretically, if the motion can be described by being controlled under the force equal to minus kx, because force equals minus kx would indicate that it's simple harmonic motion so that this motion would be possible. We have to also assume that the Earth has constant density throughout, which is, of course, not true, but let's say it was. We know the radius of the Earth is 6,378 kilometers, and the mass is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So in order to do this problem, we first need to show that the force acting on an object falling through the Earth is indeed equal to minus kx. We need to figure out what that k is. The x would be the distance away from the center of the Earth, to the point where it's at, and that would be a radius. Let's call that small r for the radius from the position where it's at to the center of the Earth. At that moment, the force acting on it would be the force of gravity by the remaining portion of the Earth that's still inside the sphere made by the radius of the location that it's at. So what we're going to do first is calculate the force that it has when it's at the very top. The force due to gravity would be equal to minus g times the mass of the object times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Now the reason why I put the minus there is because the force is negative when the position of the object is positive. So we have it in the same format as f equals minus kx. But what would the force be like when it's over at this location right there? Well let's call that f prime and at f prime that's equal to minus g times m times m prime, m prime would be the mass of the remaining portion of the Earth's sphere inside this particular orbit, and m would be the mass of the entire Earth divided by the small r squared. Now what we're going to do is re realizing that since the density is the same, we can say that the density of the whole, whole Earth is the same as the density of the portion in here. We also know that the equation of density can be found by taking the mass divided by the volume, which means that density of the whole Earth is equal to the mass of the whole Earth divided by the volume of the whole Earth, and the density of the inner portion, I'll call that density prime, is equal to the mass prime divided by the volume prime. That would be the volume remaining in here. Since we know that the density is the same throughout, we can say that the density of the whole Earth is equal to the density of the inside portion, which means we can say that the mass divided by the total volume is equal to mass prime divided by volume prime. Let's plug in some numbers and see what we get, because ultimately we want to be able to express m prime in terms of m. The total volume of the Earth can be expressed as a sphere, therefore it's 4 thirds pi the radius of the Earth cubed, this is equal to m prime divided by 4 thirds pi times r cubed, r being the distance from the center of the Earth, which is the equilibrium point, to where the object is at at that moment. Notice that we can cancel out the 4 thirds on both sides, the pi on both sides, which means that m prime is equal to m times the ratio of, that would be the radius where the object is at, divided by the radius of the Earth cubed. Now that we know that, we can express this equation, the force, that would be the force right here that the object experiences, let's call it f prime, is equal to minus g m times m prime, but m prime can be expressed with this expression right here, divided by r squared. So now we have an equation that shows us what the force is acting on the object anywhere between the edge of the earth, or the surface of the earth, and the center of the earth. Coming up here, we're going to write 
f prime is equal to minus g times the mass of the object times m prime, and m prime is equal to the mass of the earth times r cubed divided by the radius of the earth cubed, and then we still have the r squared right here, which means that this cancels out with two of those, and that would then be the equation of the force that that object experiences. In other words, f prime is equal to minus g m big M divided by radius of the earth cubed times r. And if I put this in brackets, you can then see that the component in brackets, they're all constants. G is the universal uh, gravitational constant. M is the mass of the object that's moving through the earth. Big M is the mass of the entire earth. And radius of the earth is the radius of the earth. This is all a constant. So this can then, then be compared to the equation F equals minus K times X. X is the displacement away from the equilibrium point, just like R is the, dis the distance away from the equilibrium point. So we can see that this equation is in the exact same format as F equals minus Kx, which means that an object moving through the Earth in that particular fashion would act like an object connected to a spring with simple harmonic motion. From that, we should now be able to figure out the period. Remember that omega is equal to the square root of k divided by m, and the spring constant in this case would be the quantity within the brackets. We also know that omega is equal to 2 pi times f, which means that f is equal to 2 pi times um, 2 pi, oh, let me write that again, f is equal to omega divided by 2 pi, therefore we can write that f is equal to 1 divided by 2 pi times omega, and since the period is equal to 1 divided by f, or the inverse of the frequency, this can then be written as 2 pi times 1 over omega, which means that the period can be written as 2 pi times the inverse of this, which is the square root of m divided by k. m would be the mass of the object, and k would be the quantity within the brackets right here. Let's plug that in and see what we get. The period, now remember the period would be the time for a complete oscillation, which is a round trip from there to there and back. We only want half that period eventually. This is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m divided by k. That means the numerator goes into the denominator and the denominator goes into the numerator because it's divided by k, not k itself. Divide by g m times the mass of the earth and then the radius of the earth cubed goes to the numerator, radius of the earth cubed goes to the numerator. So we have m divided by k. Notice that the mass of the object disappears, so it doesn't matter how heavy the transport object is. And now we have the equation necessary to find the period of that motion. t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the radius of the earth, which is 6,378,000 meters, because I have to convert it to meters, and we have to cube that number, divided by g, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and multiplied times the mass of the Earth, which is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. All right, all that is inside the radical, multiplied it times 2 pi, let's see what we get. 6,378,000, we cube that, we divide that by 6.67 e to the 11 minus, divide by 5.98 e to the 24th. We then take the square root of that. We multiply that times 2 and times pi. And we get a total of the period is equal to 5,067 seconds. Now, converting that to minutes to make it easier, to see what that's like. That would be, we want minutes at the top, we want seconds at the bottom, one minute is 60 seconds, divide by 60, and we get a total of 84.4 minutes, 84.4 minutes, but since we only want the one-way trip time, t divided by 2 is equal to 84.4 divided by 2 minutes, which means is 42 0.2 minutes for a trip to the other side of the world. You can see why people would actually be very interested in being able to do something like that. 
Unfortunately, traveling to the core of the earth, part of it is molten. The center core is, is solid, but it's all very super hot. The center of the earth is approximately at 6,000 degrees centigrade. There's no way you could build a tunnel through the earth and travel like that. It's a nice thing to dream about it and maybe a good source or a good science fiction movie. I remember this problem when I was a student in school. I didn't even attempt to, to solve the problem because I didn't know where to start. But the connection between this kind of thing and simple amount motion makes it possible to solve it. Again, if we can show that the force acting on an object is equal to negative, some constant times the position away from the equilibrium point, it then becomes simple amount motion, which in this case, it is exactly. And that's why it wasn't so bad to solve this problem. That's how we find it, using simple harmonic motion.